Well, Mary McLaurin uh, has an unusual condition called developmental topographical disorientation. Uh, and in short, it's called DTD. Uh, this means that she cannot form a mental map or an image of her surroundings. Unlike most people, Mary has absolutely no internal compass. Here's how she describes a, a typical incident of dealing with her DTD. She says, I was staying in a friend's house and decided to take their dog Otis for a walk. As I started back, I had no idea where I was. I was only blocks from where I had started my walk, but I was lost. Fear and adrenaline pulsed through my veins, and I began to sweat profusely. My surroundings looked completely unfamiliar. It was as though I had been dropped in the middle of a foreign land. I hadn't written down the address of the home where I was staying, and walking in any direction would just be a guess. Am I getting closer or farther away? Would I have to knock on someone's door to use their phone to call the police? How could I expect them to return to a place if I have no address to provide? Fortunately, someone found Mary and directed her back to the house. You know, with DTD, there's, there's no uh, brain injury, there's no uh, car accident, there's no tumor, there's nothing. Uh, you know, physiologically, she's absolutely fine. But people who are in this condition get lost every single day, even in the most familiar surroundings. They desperately need someone to show them how it is that they can get back to where they need to be. Now, last week we covered Exodus chapters 25 through 27. And if you remember, the big idea in those uh, chapters was that all of us truly desire to be at a place that we think of as home. And we defined home as being with God. We can't be truly home until we are with God. And the problem was that most people don't want to come to grips with the fact that being at home is being with Jesus. And so they substitute that void, that desire for home for other things, whether it be sex or drugs or alcohol or, or money or prestige or fame or whatever it is. We all have this spiritual DTD, and it always leaves us empty, wanting more, and desiring more and more of it, never being satisfied. So it's with that in mind now that we continue the Exodus saga in chapters 28 through 30, which assumes that we need to get home, but now provides for us that guide that those of us with spiritual DTD need. And that guide in this text is known as a priest. And so our big idea this morning is that God has initiated a relationship with you and with me, and He calls us to Himself through the access of not a priest, but the great priest. Let's look at this first point, that we need to delight in the work of the priest. Delight in the work of the priest. You know, the mention of a priest may, may stir up a lot of different images in your mind. Um, maybe you think of someone who wears the, the black cleric uh, with, the, with, the white, uh, with the white collar who sits behind a confessional and listens to people uh, confess their secrets and sins, or, or maybe you, you think of someone who goes through the, the motions of a mass. Uh, maybe some of you, when you think of priest, you think of a, a pagan priest or priestess that uh, might uh, organize a, a drum circle or order some sacrifices to be made. You know, your past experiences are going to shape uh, not only what comes to mind when you think about priests, but also how you feel about priests. The idea of a priest may bring up nostalgia for some of you. 
It reminds you of, of, of days gone by, pleasant days that you can remember. Maybe the idea of a priest brings up some sort of mis, uh, mystery or intrigue because they just seem mysterious and I don't know anything about them. Maybe it brings up fear and anxiety because you've had a bad experience with a priest or two. It's one feeling that doesn't usually get mustered up when you think about a priest is delight. It, it, it might be easy to delight in other professions or, or vocations. Some of you may delight in, in police officers because maybe you've had a home invasion or maybe that you've, you've, been, uh, you've needed them for safety at some point and they've come to your rescue or, or maybe they, they, they helped you in some sort of way, so you delight in that. Maybe it's the same way with, with firefighters. Maybe you've had an instance where you've dealt with fire in your home or in your business. And you delight in the fact that here are these guys that are willing to just rush into a burning building to save animals, save children, save whatever it is, and protect your stuff. Maybe you delight in EMTs or paramedics or doctors. Man, what great work they do, right? Maybe some of us delight in teachers. Man, blessed teachers. They are wonderful. We thank God for them. Carpenters and contractors that are building things and and uh, shaping things to God's glory. We thank God for them. For me, you know what I delight in? I delight in bakers. Because I love donuts. Who doesn't, right? Every time I see a donut or one comes into the office, the staff would tell you, I love donuts. And because of that, I delight in the work of a baker. I mean, cakes, fritters, whatever it is. Bakers, if any of you are a baker, I give you a thumbs up. Thank you for your service to our community. I appreciate it. But you know, when it comes to priests, they don't always have a great reputation in, the, uh, in our community. But in the Bible, a priest was everything. A priest was the central figure in the community life. The priest was the go-between person between God and his people. It was the, the priest that was the most important part of the religious life of God's people. Therefore, in chapters 28 through 30, they're completely dedicated to the person, the dress, and the work of the priest. And when we look at it in context, we can see how it is that we can delight in the work of not any, any old Old Testament priest, but we can delight in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Look with me in chapter 28, starting in verse 6. He's going to talk about the ephod here. They are to make the ephod of finely spun linen embroidered with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. It must have two shoulder pieces attached to its edges so that it can be joined together. The artistically woven waistband that is on one ephod must be of one piece according to the same worksmanship of gold, of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and of finely spun linen. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of Israel's sons, six of their names to be on the first stone and the remaining six names on the second stone, in the order of their birth. Engrave the two stones with the names of Israel's son as a, sons as a gem cutter engraves a seal. Mount them, surround them with gold filigree settings. Fasten both stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as a memorial stones for the Israelites." Aaron will carry their names on his two shoulders before the Lord as a reminder. So one of the first things that we learn about the, this priest is that they had these shoulder pads. And they're not like football shoulder pads or shoulder pads that you would think of as going uh, on a suit that you would wear, anything like that. Uh, these were uh, very, very tightly knit linen and yarn that could really hold some weight. Specifically, the weight of two large onyx stones. Onyx stones uh, typically are, are, are black and really shiny. If you've seen them, they're beautiful, uh, beautiful stones. And there's one for each shoulder. And it isn't as if he is wearing these stones for decoration. Um, but let's look again in verses 9 through 11. It says, Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of Israel's sons. Six of their names in the first stone and the remaining six no, uh, stones uh, on the second, in the order of their birth. Engrave the two stones with the names of Israel's son as a gem cutter engraves a seal. 
So as these stones are displayed uh, with the names of the tribes of Israel, it becomes apparent then that this priest, as he is doing his duty before God, is representing the 12 tribes of Israel, but not necessarily as a collective group of tribes. He is representing also every single individual that is within these 12 tribes. Let's look at verse 12 just one more time. It says, Fasten both stones on the shoulder piece of the ephod as a memorial stones for the Israelites. Aaron will carry their names on his two shoulders before the Lord as a reminder. So there's the sense that when Aaron walks in to the holiest places before God, these stones that remind him that he's painfully mindful of their weight holding him down, remind him that he is not going in for himself, but he is going in for God's people, which at this time uh, numbers about a million people. That's a lot of weight to carry on someone's shoulder. He bears their names on his shoulders. But not only does he bear their names on his shoulder, notice also that he bears their names also on his, on his heart. Look in verses, uh, well, we won't read them because it's quite a bit, but in verses 15 through 30, the Lord describes to Moses how he is supposed to make the breast piece and how it's supposed to be adorned. And it was supposed to be, again, this tightly knit uh, linen and yarn that could hold a bunch of, of weight. It was connected to the shoulder pieces, which already had the onyx on them. And on this breast piece, it was supposed to have uh, square rocks. Every single one of these stones were a different kind of stone, and it had four rows of three stones each. Now, if you do the math correctly, obviously that's 12 stones that he is carrying. Again, 12 stones that are going to represent uh, the people of God with their names on it. Now look with me in verses 29 and 30. Whenever he enters the sanctuary, Aaron is to carry the names of Israel's son over his, sons over his heart on the breastpiece for decisions as a continual reminder before the Lord. Place the Urim and the Thummim in the breastpiece for decisions, so that they will also be over Aaron's heart whenever he comes before the Lord. Aaron will continually carry the means of decisions for the Israelites over his heart before the Lord. So understand that throughout the, the Old Testament, the priest was not to be the sacrifice himself for the sins of the people. But he was supposed to, uh, to take their sins upon himself and, and have the weight feeling in his heart. Their sins, their mistakes, their, their very lives, the issues are to be on his heart as he entered into the holiest of holies. Representing everything. Think about that. What would that be like? To have the weight of that physical reminder on you as you go into perhaps the most terrifying place in the world, the holiest of holies. So he has this weight of this people on his shoulders and his heart. But notice also the gravity that goes with being in God's presence. Look in verse 31. Talking about the robe. You are to make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue yarn. There should be an opening at the top in the center of it. Around the opening, there should be a woven collar with an opening like that of body armor so that it does not tear. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn on its lower hem and all around it. Put gold bells between them all the way around so that gold bells and pomegranates alternate around the lower hem of the robe. The robe will be worn by Aaron whenever he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he enters the sanctuary before the Lord and when he exits, so that he does not die. So if you remember, uh, as we've gone through Exodus, we have learned about the absolute holiness of God. 
his set-apartness, his moral purity, how he is absolutely nothing like us. He is the greatest being in the universe, absolutely good, absolutely full of wrath, absolutely full of, of grace, and being in his presence would be terrifying. And we've noticed uh, many times about his holiness and our sinfulness, that if anyone actually goes into the presence of God, they're doomed. I mean, how many stories in Scripture do we read that when a man walks into the presence of God, their first reaction is, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. It's like that scene from The Great Outdoors, if any of you have seen The Great Outdoors, and, and John Candy's running from the bald-headed bear. You know what I'm talking about? I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. That's essentially what it is like with God. It's this feeling of impending doom. So therefore, the priests had to carefully be consecrated, which is a big word for being made holy, through God's instruction. But even then, they had to wear these bells on the bottoms of their robes. And it wasn't to, to tell God, hey, God, I'm coming. You can hear my, my spurs go jingle jangle, right? That's not what is happening here. He is wearing the bells in order for the priests that are outside of the Holy of Holies to make sure he's still alive. They can hear him walk in, those bells clanging. It might be silent for a bit as he's doing his sacrifices, but as he moves, you will still hear the bells. And as he makes his way out, they will hear the bells as he walks. It was tradition that many of the priests would wear a rope around their waist so that if they were uh, killed in action, as it were, and dropped dead there in the holiest of holies, his, his other priests could take that rope and drag him out of the holies of, holy, holy of holies so that they didn't have to go in to recover the body and create more bodies in there. They were that careful with the holiness of God. So let's put this all together. The priest bore the weight of the people on his shoulders. He had their names written on his heart and carried their griefs and was confronted upon the threat of death in being in God's presence. But even then, it was not enough. It wasn't sufficient because even though they were consecrated, they were still sinners. They would need to go through this ritual day after day after day because can you imagine what it would be like that you go and you get absolved from your sins and all of a sudden uh, it just wipes your slate clean and you walk out of the place where you've been absolved, you stub your toe, you say a bad word, you, you treat your spouse wrong, or, or you wrong somebody in some way, guess what? You've got that sin against you again. So the priests, every single day, had to make themselves uh, consecrated again and again and again and again. So what we see then is that these priests we're actually looking and pointing to something greater, something that would come at another time. Look with me at what Hebrews chapter 7 says. For this is the kind of high priest that we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as the high priests do, first for their own sins, then for the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. For the law appoints, uh, appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. So what these priests then were doing is they were pointing to the work that Jesus would do on our behalf, who, because he was God in the flesh, 
did not need to continually consecrate himself, did not continually need to uh, get his slate clean, but rather he would bear the sin of his people, carrying the weight of their sin on his shoulders. Look with me in in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. It says, He himself bore our sins. Look at that word, bore. He took it upon himself so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punished for the peace was on, punishment for, the, for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have turned our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. So, whereas the Levitical priests would have the names of the tribes on his heart, Jesus has our individual names written on his hands. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 49. It says, can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And you might ask, well, how in the world does this work? Because I thought the priest put it on their heart, not on their hands. How can we compare these two? We compare this to the fact that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was the ultimate act of love flowing from a heart of love. And so when Jesus um, thinks about us, instead of looking down on his heart, all he needs to do is look down at the evidence of his love, a nail-scarred hand with your name on it bearing the marks of crucifixion. And because he has the scar and he has your name on it, he will not forget you. And when he entered into the most holy place, Jesus did not wear bells to avoid death, but rather he went willingly to the cross embracing death on our behalf, not because of his unholiness, but because of ours. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 9. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. You know, there's an old hymn uh, that's been made popular nowadays. Nowadays, it's called Before the Throne of God Above. Uh, it was originally called The Advocate, written in 1863. But the first verse, and I'm not going to sing it for you, uh, goes like this. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is Love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. That is the work of the great high priest Jesus. Delight in his work. Trust in his work today. So that's our our first point today. Our second point is that we need to let someone else carry the weight of your guilt. Let someone else carry the weight of your guilt. You know, I have been through a lot of schooling. I went through 12 years of public school. I was on the the five-year plan in college. I did three years in seminary. Uh, which if you do the math there, that's 20 years of schooling. That's not to to brag at all, 
um, it is rather saying that I have a lot of experience carrying weight on my back, okay? I have a stack of books here. Even today, I feel this. Um, This is typically about the amount of stuff that is in my backpack on a normal day today, okay? This is an awful lot. In fact, I'm going to put the big stuff in first. I have my trusty computer, which is not so trusty. In fact, I have a love-hate relationship with this thing. That's usually in the back. I have a notebook with all of my sermon notes that I write, uh, preparing and planning. That usually goes on here. I have my iPad, which I'm actually using now. Uh, A French grammar guide, trying to learn French. I have um, a Greek New Testament workbook. I'm trying to refresh myself in Greek. Usually bring that home. I have all of my commentaries from Exodus that I use if I need to write my sermon somewhere else rather than than here at the office. I usually have a Bible. The room's getting kind of tight in here. Ah, Shove it in there. Oh, you know what? I have an extra pocket. So bless Amazon Basics for their backpacks here. I'm going through a Tim Keller preaching book, Uh, a Greek grammar book. This is pretty typical. Um, Becoming a Welcoming Church by Tom Rainer. I'm slowly going through this. It's a great book. And a paper planner, because none of us can miss a meeting, which I have done a time or two. So, I have all of this, including all the pens and pencils that I have here in the front. And now, I'm going to attempt to put it on my back. This is a lot of weight I can't walk very fast with this thing. In fact, when I walk with this thing, it's typically like this. Because if I go like this, it's going to tip me back, okay? This is a lot of weight to bear. It gets so full that I just can't really carry it anymore. But you know what? This is what the weight of sin and guilt feels like. It feels like a backpack that keeps getting more full and more full and more full and more full until you either get knocked over or you can no longer carry it. It is filled with everything that you have ever said, done, or thought in a sinful matter, manner. Everything you've written, letter, email, text, mistakes that you've made. For some of you, your pack may be filled with the guilt that comes with shame. Maybe you've been victimized by something and you carry that weight around with you all the time. Abuse that you received, ridicule, that shame oftentimes brings guilt. And it all just gets stuffed down more and more and it creates all this weight. And every one of us has this weight And sometimes, uh, not only uh, does it get to be too much, but even one or two of those books can be cumbersome. And it holds us back from truly living. It holds us back from what God would have in store for us. It holds us back in relationships. It holds us back in our prayer life. And every one of us has this. And so the question that many of us ask is, how do I get rid of this weight? Because I cannot bear it anymore. And I think the text tells us this morning that we are to give that weight to Jesus and to lay on Him all of our burdens, all of our sufferings, all of our issues. Look with me in chapter 28 in starting in verse 36. You are to make a pure gold medallion and to engrave it like the engraving of a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten it to a cord of blue yarn so it can be placed on the turban. The medallion is to be on the front of the turban. 
It will be on Aaron's forehead so that Aaron may bear the guilt connected with the holy offerings that the Israelites consecrate as all their holy gifts. It is always to be on his forehead so that they may find acceptance with the Lord. So here now is this representative of the people. And part of his priestly outfit is this, this, this turban, this, this hat that he wears. It's got this inscription that says, Holy to the Lord. It's set apart for the Lord. He has no other purpose at that very moment than doing the Lord's work. And it is meant to be on his head as a reminder as he bears their guilt. And it is on his forehead as their representative so that they then could be accepted by God. And just as we send the first point, it was also insufficient and it was temporary. Because imagine with me, you're at school, you have a heavy backpack, something like this. You, you can't carry this around anymore. You don't want to use your locker for whatever reason. And someone comes up to you and says, can I carry that for you? You know, I mean, that looks like an awful lot of weight to carry. Can I just carry that? Most of us, we'd probably be put off a little bit by that. No, you don't, pff, no. This is my weight to bear. I don't know. No. But you know, this guy looks nice. He's strong and, and he's willing. So, okay, well, give him, give him your backpack. And he carries it for you for the day. Then at the end of the day, he picks up that backpack and he gives it back to you and says, okay, thanks for letting me hold it that day. And you never know when he's going to show up again and you go in day after day after day and you still are bearing this weight, waiting for someone to take it off of your back once again. That's what happens with the priesthood. They can bear the guilt. The sacrifices could absolve you But then after the sacrifice is made, we sin again. And the sin isn't taken care of. Um, You are left with this guilt again. You are given more stuff to continue to put back in the backpack once again. Now, when it came to Jesus, uh, he fully bore the guilt and the weight of all of our sins, past, present, and future. Look with me in Matthew chapter 11. This is what Jesus told his followers. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Some translations say heavy laden. It's that weight that's on you. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus invites you to give him all of your burdens. He invites you to give him your shame. He invites you to give him your guilt. This is a great offer, friends. In Romans chapter 7, you might be familiar with that chapter, Paul describes what life is like, and we all have faced this. He, he goes on talking about how he wants to do what's right. He, he has in mind the good that he wants to do, but for whatever reason, he can't do it. He keeps doing the exact opposite thing that he wants to do. And you and I know what that's like. We want to do good. We want to do what's right, but we just don't have it in us. And so Paul ends up saying in Romans chapter 7 and verse 24, he says, What a wretched man am I! Who will will rescue me from this body of death? And then he tells us who. Thanks be to God. Through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Peter tells his readers, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. See, here's the thing. When we give Jesus our backpack of struggles and burdens, he never gives it back to us at the end of the day. He says, give it to me. I'm going to carry it for the rest of your life. Let me take that upon my self. You know, going to school with a heavy backpack is one thing, but living a life 
plagued with guilt, fear, and shame, man, that's a heavy load that we shouldn't have to bear. But as it is, we don't need to live life slowing down and and being held back. We have someone that will carry that weight for us. We have Jesus Christ who took all that weight upon himself on the cross. Why not give yourself to him today? Why not, if you've never known him, why not right today say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I can't live with this guilt anymore. Go to him in faith, and he will forgive you. He'll redeem you. He will make you new. And maybe you're walking away from God, or maybe you've never dealt with things, and you've been a Christian for a while, and you have this guilt, and you have this burden. Give it to Jesus. He is fully willing and fully able to take it from you, and he will never give it back. You know, Mary McLaren may suffer from physical development topographical disorientation, but you and I, We don't need to suffer from spiritual DTD. God desires us to be with him. And he has come to us in Jesus Christ. It is in Christ that we find our true home. And it is in Christ that we find the way home. Let him bring you there. By God's grace, through faith, delighting in his works, laying all of your burdens upon him, for he cares about you. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, we come here with just a a load of, of worries and cares.